Hi, everybody. It's meteorologist Joe Chaffee on another day with uh, record-breaking temperatures from uh, southeastern Pennsylvania and New Jersey across New York City, the Hudson Valley, and Long Island. Some places the bar for breaking a record today is not that high. It only needed to get to 74, uh, for example, at, uh, in, at Islip, and you know, this is as of 10 a.m. It's already 73. And these temperatures here in northeastern New Jersey, for example, Newark has to get to 80 to set it up to tie a record. So um, it, it looks like there's going to be some widespread records being taken out. And, and, and you have to try to understand that, you know, some stations have larger data sets than others. Um, Islip's data set, for example, on Long Island doesn't go back very far. It only goes back about 50 or so years, or maybe even less. Uh, Newark's goes back further. Central Park goes back up to 1869. So and when they break a record, it's it's a little more significant because at least you can look back and say, oh, wow, this happened back in 1898. So whatever we're seeing, it's not something that's new. And it really isn't anything that's new. Okay, so let's go to the tropics and take a look at what's happening with this disturbed weather that's sitting east of the Bahamas. And one of the things that uh, I want to point out is that this is really, at this point, not a very tropical-looking system. You've got this very broad area of uh, showers and thunderstorms. There's really uh, it's kind of a separation in here where there isn't, isn't much weather going on. And uh, this area back through here looks like it's flaring up a bit. So you do have a low-pressure center there, but when we uh, look at this visible satellite loop in motion, you don't really see any low-level circulation. You don't see a concentration of thunderstorms around such a center. Uh, but, you know, we do have pressures that are below normal here. And we'll have to see if this flare-up that's going on now becomes anything significant later today. Models and uh, conditions, um, are, models are, uh, con and conditions are favorable for something either subtropical or tropical to develop. I'm kind of starting to favor the idea of maybe it's going to be more subtropical than anything else, but let's see what happens as we go forward. And you can look at the water vapor imagery. That first area of storms out to the east that formed last night is getting carried away to the northeast, and now you have this flare-up back through here. Uh, there's, there might be some kind of upper low that's back just just to the east of the Bahamas, so that, that might be playing a role in in how this thing winds up evolving. So going forward, you know, one of the things about taking storms up the East Coast is, especially if, if they're going to uh, impact areas uh, from Virginia northward into southern New England, is that the track and, and the upper air have to line up exactly. And that's a very hard thing to do. It can't be almost... Uh, a perfect lineup. It has to be just about a perfect lineup. And there has to be uh, things going on in the atmosphere that are conducive to pulling it up the East Coast. And when we watch this system, this is the NAM, the new NAM model today. You can see it does wrap it up and it does develop it. And when, when you look at how it uh, blows up the radar echoes, it kind of looks like a tropical system. And initially it takes it northwestward and as we move into Thursday night and Friday, it begins to move north and northeastward. And what's happening is you're getting non-tropical development that's going on across the northeast. Uh, there's a low that's shown in west, in west central New York. There's a low out here that's redeveloping in the ocean. And that's eventually all going to combine into one storm once it goes northeast of Cape Cod. But I think what's probably going to happen is that you're going to have this tropical system be drawn north and northeastward and just eventually get absorbed by uh, this uh, feature that is developing, that's going to be developing. And by the way, that feature here is going to be the catalyst to bring down a shot of some pretty chilly air for this coming weekend. Uh, some of the other longer range models from last night uh, did indeed show this. Now, I want to uh, transition over to the long range because I did a little looking yesterday. And when we get into the winter months, I, I like to look at um, what's called the North Atlantic Oscillation and the Arctic Oscillation. Okay, so you're going to ask me, well, what is that? Okay, here's the deal. Um, pressures rise and fall all the time. Uh, the North Atlantic Oscillation and the Arctic Oscillation basically monitor uh, changes uh, in, um, in pressure because that displaces cold air. So when you have pressures rising, 
in the Arctic regions, what that does is that it, it, it winds up displacing cold air from where you would think it would normally be in the Arctic regions and displacing it southward. I'm giving you a very kind of oversimplified uh, you know, definition of this, but I just want so that everybody can understand it. So what the North Atlantic Oscillation is saying, and, 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 and the measure goes from, a, a net, usually the range is from negative two to po positive two, sometimes it, it goes above those extremes, zero being neutral. So when the, uh, the index that measures this goes negative, it's telling us that pressures uh, are rising up in the um, Arctic region, specifically for the North Atlantic Oscillation, we're referring to areas around Greenland, okay, in that part of the North Atlantic. So when that happens, cold air gets displaced southward. And what I was very interested, it was, I thought it was very interesting that the North Atlantic Oscillation, the index has been kind of hovering near or just above the neutral line just about all month. And now it is forecast to go uh, negative as we move uh, into the latter part of the month. So that's important. So that's telling us that there's going to be a displacement of cold air southward from the North Atlantic Oscillation. It's also, we call it the Greenland block. So when I refer to that, you know, oftentimes in the wintertime, if you have a situation where you have a blocking uh, high in Greenland, that can lead to cold and snowy conditions in the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic. The other oscillation index we looked at is the Arctic Oscillation. So this looks basically up at the Arctic region itself. So I was actually quite surprised to see how negative it, it, it has been for much of this month. So this probably accounts for those two shots of cool air that we saw uh, in the last uh, two weeks. Now that oscillation index found, is finding its way back to zero, but then it's forecast to go sharply negative again toward the end of the month. So what this is really telling us is that we're going to uh, see a trend to colder than normal temperatures overall uh, very soon. Once we get rid of this uh, big ridge in the east, that appears to be uh, where we're going in the longer range. And I think we also have to explore the possibilities that it could also may, it could also finally mean a change in the overall um, weather pattern that has been so dry uh, in the eastern states. Now, there's no guarantee of that happening, but um, I'm going to just put up, let's go to uh, North America so I can show you um, what's happening, you know, with regards to this type of development. So I'm going to pull up the European model. And when, when we move it along, when you move it along, you can see what's happening here um, down later next week. You've got building high pressure all up through the Greenland area and also back up through the Arctic regions. And, you know, this sort of sets up uh, what we would call um, cross-polar flow. In other words, the air comes across the poles and then finds its way down into the northeast. And it's pulls, it, get, it gets pulled down by some kind of upper air vortex that parks itself in eastern Canada. Also, at the same time, you know, you have other things going on uh, that are important, like this deep trough that's off the west coast because what happens then in response to that deep trough is that you get a strong ridge in the west so that provides uh, the alleyway for colder air to come down out of Canada. Now the question is whether this is a uh, going to be a short-term blip that lasts for a few days to a week or is it something that's going to last uh, deeper into November and that's something that um, are, is a little difficult to say. Uh, there's always going to be some sort of fluctuations back and forth on a regular basis anyway. Uh, but, uh, you know, if the overall pattern, the, the question would be whether the overall pattern is that way. And the GFS kind of, sort of is in line with this. Um, if we look at it and go through the longer term, you know, there seems to be a basic tendency for mostly higher pressures up in northern Canada northward. And then that displaces the jet further south. And, and actually, this particular view, I'm not saying it's going to look like this, but this particular view really shows it pretty well in that you have uh, the jet stream pretty far to the south, and up here you have a lot of higher pressures uh, aloft uh, that build up uh, toward the Arctic region. So again, this would favor probably a colder and stor stormier pattern longer term. Um, the day-to-day -day is a much more difficult thing. Uh, to uh, view, and that is a short-range forecast problem that we will deal with. So, all right, so look, tropicaltidbits.com, uh, the supplier of all this maps, uh, Levi Cowan, thank you so much. Um, also, don't forget, 
uh, meteorologist joechaffee.com, weatherlongisland.com, nycweathernow.com, and ssstormchasers.com for all your storm chasing wants, needs, and desires.